Good afternoon. <laughs> I have a few more words to say, but uh, <laughs> I'm Mike McFadden, president of the American Geophysical Union. As you know, AGU's mission is to promote discovery in earth and space science for the benefit of humanity. One of the ways in which we strive to do this is through highlighting innovative and new science at our fall meeting. That's why I'm so pleased to introduce this session to you today. On March 26, 2012, James Cameron became the first person in history to reach the Earth's deepest known point as a solo pilot, successfully piloting the Deep Sea Challenger nearly 11 kilometers, almost 36,000 feet, to the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. The dive was part of the Deep Sea Challenge expedition to investigate the New Britain and Mariana Trenches, mounted by Cameron and a team of engineers, scientists, and educators. The expedition captured, captured video of unprecedented clarity and collected sediment, physical oceanographic data, and biological samples. The participants in today's panel, the Deep Sea Challenge, New Science and Technology at Extreme Depths, We'll discuss the innovation associated with the development of the Deep Sea Challenger submersible, including full ocean depth 3D cameras and a now patented new syntactic foam. The panelists will also discuss the preliminary scientific findings from the expedition. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Simons, who will be serving as moderator for this panel. Uh, as a science spokeswoman, Dr. Simons has logged more than 200 days at sea on board research vessels, and she's also participated in dives aboard submersibles Alvin and Avalon. Her research has contributed to unraveling the complex tectonic history of the Pacific Basin. She's earned her bachelor's degree at Stanford University, her master's degree at the University of Texas at Austin, and her PhD in earth sciences from my alma mater, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Before we begin, I would like to request that you do not record or capture images or video. Most of these will be available on demand following the presentation. Thank you. And Dr. Simons, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to AGU Executive Director Chris McEntee, and those at AGU who made our presence here possible, in particular Billy Williams. We also want to acknowledge and thank National Geographic and Rolex, primary participants and sponsors of the Deep Sea Challenge Expedition, along with the Blue Planet Marine Research Foundation. Today I have the pleasure of introducing to you the Deep Sea Challenge Expedition. I was fortunate to have been part of the expedition this past spring when, as Mike has mentioned, James Cameron surrounded by a dedicated, driven team of engineers, made history by successfully piloting a one-person submersible to the deepest place on Earth, the Challenger Deep. The first ever manned scientific exploration of the New Britain and Mariana Trenches, the expedition returned with unparalleled 3D images and video, sediment, rock, and water samples, as well as CTD profiles from its two free-falling landers, over its multiple dives. The post-expedition analysis of samples has been a collaboration among institutions under the direction of the Deep Sea Challenge scientists. Our chief scientist, Doug Bartlett, professor of microbiology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, will report on physical oceanographic analyses, megafaunal observations, and finally, his own work characterizing deep sea microbes. Patty Fryer, a marine geologist from University of Hawaii's Institute of Geophysics and Planetology and a veteran of numerous campaigns to map and explore the Mariana Trench, will emphasize why we must continue investigating the oceans, largely unexplored trenches, and the real-world impact of subduction zone processes. Kevin Hand, a planetary scientist and astrobiologist from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is run by the California Institute of Technology, will present some results from the Serena Deep and he'll connect our exploration of the Mariana Trench to oceans beyond Earth. But before we get to the science, there's Jim's Cam Jim Cameron's radically new sub-design and engineering, his own. Capable of withstanding pressures on the order of 16,000 PSI, 
outfitted to image the deep sea environment and collect samples for analysis. You all know Jim Cameron as a filmmaker. He wrote, produced, and directed Terminator 2, Aliens, Abyss, and True Lies, as well as the two highest grossing, most successful films ever, Titanic and Avatar, in which he took us on a journey a century back in time and then forward to a faraway alien world. From CG to 3D for almost three decades, Jim has led the film industry in production technologies, constantly pushing creative and technical boundaries by engineering tools that are transformative. You may not know Jim in the context of marine exploration and deep ocean science. Deep Sea Challenge is, in fact, his eighth expedition. He has now logged more than 85 submersible dives, most to depths greater than two kilometers. He has investigated hydrothermal vents at mid-ocean ridges in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Sea of Cortez, as well as the final resting place of the Titanic in the North Atlantic. He developed unprecedented filming, lighting, and robotic equipment for use in extreme pressures, including revolutionary fiber optic spooling mini ROVs called spider bots to explore the Titanic. Jim's expeditions provided the substance for his marine documentaries, among them Ghosts of the Abyss and Aliens of the Deep, the latter of which our own Kevin Hand was a participant. They reflect Jim's commitment to promote science by bringing the experience of deep ocean exploration to audiences around the world. Jim is committed to the principle that to explore mandates being able to communicate. On Deep Sea Challenge, he has done so in a way that is unprecedented and historic. The stunning images he has captured of the sea floor feed our sense of curiosity, fuel our imagination, and drive our desire for discovery. With that, I will leave it to Jim to take you to the deepest place on Earth, the Challenger Deep. Jim Cameron. Well, thanks, everybody. It's a great honor to get to uh, address this distinguished group. And it's a great honor for me to be here in the company of, of uh, these four scientists, uh, you know, my, my, uh, the science team on the expedition. Um, I'm not a scientist, and uh, so I, I rely on them to, uh, you know, point us in the right direction. Uh, I call it adult supervision. Um, but uh, what, what I, I believe my role is as an enabler of science through the development of, of technology. Uh, camera systems, uh, vehicle systems, and so on, and also an enabler of science in a sense through the, the media products of our, of our expeditions because the films that go out and, and inspire that awe and wonder about the, uh, about the deep in, in school children and so on, uh, I think actually plays an important part in what ultimately becomes the, the funding uh, cycle, which we all know so well is, is never sufficient for this, this type of work. Um, so I think, you know, being a kind of cheerleader for science on the one hand in these media products, films, and television specials is uh, probably as important as the development of, uh, of new technology. Now, I, I tend to think like an engineer, uh, and uh, I love engineering, and I love uh, imagining how, uh, how the uh, technical solutions to going into these uh, very inhospitable environments, intense pressure regimes, and, and so on, uh, how these problems can be solved. So um, I'm going to try to quickly, as quickly as possible, uh, present to you the, the two science platforms that we developed for the um, uh, Deep Sea Challenge project. The first, obviously, was the, the Deep Sea Challenger vehicle itself, but we also developed two large uh, robotic lander vehicles, and all three of, all three of those had uh, the 11,000 meter uh, depth capability. We did our sea trials and some science dives of both systems uh, together. Uh, starting in the um, uh, New Britain Trench in Papua New Guinea, which sounds a bit strange at first, but it, it turned out to be in a direct line between Sydney, where the sub was built, and Guam, which was the nearest staging point for the, for the Challenger Deep. Uh, but what we, w what we found out is that the, the New Britain Trench had uh, very little uh, data available other than uh, some soundings that had been done by the Australian Navy in the 1960s, and uh, one uh, bathymetric uh, multi-beam track that had been shot by the RV uh, Sona, uh, the German uh, uh, RV, uh, which had just been transiting from point A to point B and happened to go right over uh, the deepest uh, point 
uh, in the New Britain Trench at, at 8,200 meters. So that, uh, that bit of uh, fine bathymetry, uh, Patty's going to talk about and how she interpreted that for us. Um, we, we wound up doing four sub-dives and 15 lander dives in the New Britain Trench. Uh, and then we were able to do two sub-dives and three lander dives in the uh, Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench um, at uh, 10,900 uh, meters depth. And there was uh, an additional lander dive that was done in the Sirena Deep, uh, which is fairly nearby, about 100 kilometers to the east of the Challenger Deep sites. And we did two relatively shallow dives in about 1,200 meters uh, in, uh, just off Ulithi Atoll uh, toward the end of the program. So 20 lander dives in, in total. Our science goals were quite ambitious for this project, uh, which was uh, Im important to me. I wanted this to be more than just an engineering demonstration of, of new technology, but to actually return um, uh, real science. Um, but uh, unfortunately, our original planned dive series was uh, uh, reduced significantly due to the tragic loss of two dear friends of mine in a helicopter crash, um, Andrew White, who was the director of the film uh, that was partially paying for the expedition and he was also the expedition leader and our underwater cinematographer Mike Degree. And unfortunately this significantly reduced our time on site uh, at the Mariana Trench toward the end of our, our program. And so only two of our planned eight dives uh, to full ocean depth with the submersible were accomplished. Uh, one was piloted and one was an unpiloted test dive. So the Deep Sea Challenger is actually based on certain principles that make it, uh, I think, very unusual. Um, we wanted it to be a research platform, so it had to have all of the usual things one would expect, lights, uh, HD cameras, a manipulator, uh, sample drawer, uh, and some, some additional sample payload space or, or payload space for instrumentation on future miss missions, depth sensors, CTD, all that sort of thing. And so this was going to obviously drive the, the dry weight up between just a bare platform that would be needed for uh, a human-occupied dive to that depth. At the same time, we wanted to have a vehicle that was consistent with, with modern research submersibles uh, that could be offloaded from a, from a ship, launched and recovered, uh, versus the 150-ton uh, Bathyscaphe Trieste, which had to be towed out to the, uh, to the dive site. Uh, at, the, at the kind of pressures we were going to dive to, uh, that would also signif significantly uh, drive up that dry weight that we had to handle on the deck of the ship. So to withstand the 16,500 PSI of, of pressure uh, and give ourselves a, a 2.2 to 1 safety, factor of safety on, uh, on a buckling failure on the sphere, uh, the sphere, the pilot sphere, would need a wall thickness that was going to make it significantly uh, negatively buoyant and therefore require a large amount of flotation. Unfortunately, the syntactic foam uh, available for, for that pressure regime is quite dense in and of itself and, and would add tons of dry weight to the submersible in order to offset the, the negative uh, uh, parts of the sub such as the uh, manipulator arm and the, and the pilot sphere and thrusters and so on. So keeping the sphere itself as small as possible was one of the primary drivers of the design. And so we decided on a single occupant vehicle. At the time we made that decision, we had hoped that we might have a uh, fiber comm system such as they use on, on uh, Nereus uh, in order to augment the, the pilot and reduce the task loading, but we weren't able to integrate that into our first phase program. Um, we also adopted an upright position for the pilot in the sphere, and this is very unusual. Most submersibles, as, as you know, the pilot's in a prone position watching through the porthole. In the upright position, uh, the um, uh, sort of the packing density uh, was a little higher, so uh, made for a smaller sphere and, and less weight. Uh, but it meant that, that uh, the pilot's eyes are uncoupled from the viewport itself. And so I was actually flying the sub based on, on uh, four HD monitors, which actually gave me a very, very good view space and very good situational awareness. I had, I had four external HD cameras two of which were in a stereo pair configuration on a pan and tilt that allowed me to look straight down, straight up, inspect the vehicle from outside on the end of a, a two-meter boom. So that worked very well. So I actually could, could see quite well uh, and had good uh, uh, awareness on the, on the vehicle. Uh, to dive to, uh, to full ocean depth, you're traveling down 11 kilometers, up 11 kilometers, 22-kilometer uh, round trip. But, uh, you know, I knew from my previous submersible experience uh, in the mirrors and deep rovers and so on, 
that um, you tend to, to not really do much uh, horizontal exploration in terms of distance. A kilometer or two at the most, you're, st you're moving slowly, you're looking for, for uh, megafauna, you're stopping taking samples and, and, and images and so on. So I was thinking that that was, you know, uh, uh, an, uh, essentially an 11 to 1 ratio, uh, 22 to 2. Uh, so it occurred to us that, that it was important to optimize the vehicle hydrodynamically for vertical travel rather than the usual horizontal paradigm on, on most subs and that this would allow us to spend as little time in the water column as possible descending and ascending and as much time as possible on the bottom doing images and, and sample gathering. Um, and again, this was an, an, an adaptation to the, uh, to the small sphere as well because there was no room to sort of stand up and stretch your legs uh, in, uh, in that sphere like you'd have in a mere submersible. And so that's basically what we built is a vertical torpedo. And I'm going to try to navigate through this, uh, this quick time video here. Um, so this is, an over, this is an overview of the vehicle. Uh, and here's the pilot sphere. And I'll, let me fire up my laser pointer. Uh, so you've got a fairly standard design for a hatch and viewport. It's an acrylic port. It's about uh, nine inches thick. Here's a penetrator plate with four penetrators. This is just a graphics error here. These are little uh, elastomer pads that are used to isolate the sphere from the, from the beam when it's installed. So here's the, the main structural beam of the entire submersible is made out of a solid piece of syntactic foam. It's actually assembled uh, uh, through a, a, a glue uh, a gluing process uh, from, from smaller blocks. So this is the strap system that holds the, the sphere in place. And I'm just going to pause it for a second. Uh, the straps were required because that structural beam uh, actually shrinks three inches uh, during, the, um, uh, during the descent to full pressure. And so uh, a rigid fastener system between the sphere and the, and the beam was not a good idea. So these were, these were tension, spring-loaded tensioners back here and, uh, and down here. Uh, and that, that system worked very well. We'll uh, continue on here. And all right, so this is the sphere attached to the beam. And again, these uh, elastomer uh, pads were used to, uh, to create an interface there. So there was some compliance because the, the beam was squeezing at a different rate, had a different bulk modulus than the sphere itself. And there's the, there's the whole system. So next we'll see the, uh, the battery modules come on, and these are machine syntactic foam blocks. Now the significant thing here is that the syntactic foam that we developed, which is, called, which is uh, marketed under the term ISO, uh, name Isofloat, uh, was developed by Ron Allum, who is the, the co-designer of the vehicle. Um, it has twice the, the um, uh, tensile strength as the, the other grades of uh, full ocean depth foam that are out there. And it also has a very, very uniform uh, in, in, uh, internal density. Uh, which was necessary to build these big monolithic uh, structures. Uh, an individual block of, of, the, uh, of the other foams that are available tends to generate a slight curvature under pressure because one side is denser than the other. It's the manufacturing process. Uh, so we used a hydroclaving um, uh, uh, pressure, curing, pressure curing technique to uh, create a foam. But that also gave it very good machining uh, characteristics. One of the issues with the uh, high density, uh, high energy density lithium batteries is the potential for, for a thermal runaway or some kind of a battery fire. So we created a battery system that isolated each individual cell pack of 16 cells from the others using the foam, which turned out to have the same uh, kind of thermal insulating properties as something like phenolic. So it turned out to be a great all-purpose material. So I'll go, go ahead here and you'll see the, um, uh, the batteries come on. Let's see. I'll just, uh, I'm going to scrub here. All right, so uh, I've gone too far. All right, so this is, the, this is the, uh, the battery pods now populated with the individual cell packs in each one of these, these pigeonholes. This is what we call the cam tail, which was basically a, a fairing. When the sub is in its flying position, which is vertical, this forms the, the trailing edge of the vehicle. Are we playing here? Okay, all right. I think my plan to scrub through this quickly is, uh, is not working quite the way I planned. Um, okay. All right, so what's coming on here are two large uh, uh, syntactic blocks. We called these the, the thruster blocks, and uh, these weighed about 700 pounds apiece. And uh, the idea, again, we're using the syntactic itself structurally. 
Uh, these are the thrusters. We had 12 thrusters. Uh, we, we had to design and build our own thrusters with integrated uh, PBOF control electronics. The entire sub was based on the principle of, uh, of uh, PBOF, uh, um, oil filled, rather than having implodable volumes on the sub. And so that put a lot of pressure on the electronics engineers to, uh, okay, here we see the uh, LED lights. Let me just pause that for a moment. The LED lights, again, are, are oil filled, f fairly standard in concept. We just, uh, we just mass manufactured them. And I think we ultimately wound up with 36 of them on the, on the sub. A few were taken off the top row here to make room for two big LED spotlights that joined the party fairly, fairly late after, this, uh, after these graphics were done. And I'm going to skip the next part and go. OK, these are polycarbonate. These are polycarbonate covers. We could actually see through the sub. It was kind of, it was, uh, had clear sides, so we could actually see all the LED telltales on the, um, on the battery system at when the sub was actually uh, in the water and, and on the bottom. And this is just the uh, telemetry mast at the top. This is the only, the only part of the sub we could see when the sub was at the surface. And these are the two ACOMS transducers, the primary and the, and the backup here, that allowed voice communication at 11,000 meters. And that was developed by uh, uh, L3. This is just the top shroud. The uh, composite materials uh, were actually polyester resin, which would not delaminate under extreme pressure from the, uh, uh, from the epoxy matrix. Uh, this is a, 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 a composite lower section, which we called the lower pod. And the lower pod contained, these are the two drop weights. That one's the, the starboard weight over there. It's kind of a little confusing to see. That's the, the port uh, drop weight assembly. These are the two booms, one for the lights, one for the camera in their folded and stowed position. And this is the stowed manipulator here. And that's uh, pretty much a complete sub. So all of those uh, sub-assemblies were incorporated into that lower pod and, and uh, bolted on as a separate sub-assembly. So this is the forging of the, of the uh, sphere. This is an EN26 uh, steel, um, which is uh, essentially a, gu a gun, uh, gun barrel steel. And we use steel because uh, uh, the titanium was going to take us two and a half years to, to source and about two and a half million dollars. So we, we did steel. And we actually were able, through heat treating, to get performance out of the steel that was almost as good as titanium. Uh, so we were, we were pretty happy with the outcome. This is just the machining process. Um, after the, uh, the forging. So we had two forged hemispheres, which then were uh, welded at an equatorial join. And you can see the, uh, the welding process in progress here. This, this uh, groove gets completely filled in by layer after layer of beads, and, and it was ground down for deoxidation between each, um, between each pass. This is probably any of you familiar with this stuff. I can't see my, my cursor. Oh, there it is. Okay, you can skip past this. So this is the, uh, the heat treating in process here. Uh, it's not a fine enough control. I can't really scrub through this very well on this computer. Okay, all right. I'm, I think I'm just going to have to let this play, guys. This is not working the way I planned. All right. I can't seem to get a, a fine scrub on it. It was working better the other day. Okay, so we ground down each welding pass, you know, to remove the oxidation and built it up slowly. The, the uh, weld material was developed by Ron Allum. Uh, he built his own sort of compressive testing lab to make sure that the weld wouldn't fail. We didn't want the sphere failing at the weld. Uh, so this is the, the heat treating process here. And uh, you can see it going into the oil bath, uh, which was a quenching. And we were able to take the, uh, the basic EN26 steel up from I think it's uh, uh, native uh, yield strength is around uh, um, 1,000 megapascals. We took it up to about 1,250, something like that, through the heat treating process. And one of the other reasons that we selected this material is that we could subsequently machine it after the, um, after the heat treating to, for a, a fine, fine passes, which allowed us to reduce weight even farther. So this is the uh, all-up testing of the, of the assembled sphere. Uh, port, hatch, and, and penetrators. And you can see us reaching almost uh, 16,000 PSI here. The chamber at Penn State does not uh, go all the way to 16,500. So um, we used uh, strain gauges. Sorry, I've moved on. We used strain gauges to make sure that, uh, that the projected curves of, of, the, um, of the sphere uh, would be fine. Uh, and it, it, it all performed exactly according to the FEA. So this is a block of the syntactic foam going into the pressure chamber here. 
Uh, we tested every single block. You can see the blocks are manufactured in, in quite large blocks, about three and a half cubic feet. And uh, this is a 20,000 PSI pressure chamber. We tested each block to 18,000 uh, PSI, so a little above its, its actual uh, uh, pressure at depth. And then the blocks were infusion glued uh, into these big monolithic uh, segments. So this is, this is an assembled segment here, and they're putting another segment together in the, in the, uh, in the foreground. I've sort of covered the foam, so maybe I can speed up through this. The foam was, uh, was uh, you know, uh, fine machined and so on. Let's speed up. This is part of the infusion gluing process here. And then the, the, the finishing. The foam, uh, the foam beam, this is, the, this is the socket end of the beam. The foam beam was covered with a uh, uh, polyester laminate which uh, gave, it, gave it external strength and, pre and uh, prevented crack propagation. And so um, it essentially was a giant surfboard. It was built just like a surfboard. And here you can see the completed beam uh, about to ship out of the uh, composite laminator. From the time this beam arrived in our shop in Sydney to the time I did the first dive of the sub was a little under two months. So at this, uh, this is about the way the sub looked at this time last year uh, in early December with uh, some of the larger components going onto it. And you can see the open spaces for the, um, uh, the battery cell packs in that kind of pigeonhole structure. This is Tim Bowman putting in the, uh, the ACOMS transducer. And this is the uh, bare uh, kind of telemetry mast at the top of the sub. I'm going to just go ahead here a little bit, hopefully. Okay, here we go. That's a, oops. You'd think a filmmaker would have his materials a little better together. <laughs> well, this was edited, by, edited in Los Angeles while I was in, uh, while I was in New Zealand, so I'm, I'm kind of struggling here with this. I just want to find an image of the, okay, this is the lower pod what we call the lower pod. And so this is the assembled, this is the assembled pod here. Um, so this is the, the shot hopper that, that carried about 150 kilos of, of uh, steel, steel ball bearings. This is an annular magnet that was used to lock that in place that was a PBOF magnet. Uh, you've got uh, two uh, HPUs back here. So we had full redundancy in the HPUs, a bunch of compensators. And this is the uh, manipulator arm here, which is a DOER uh, arm built uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, but it's a custom one designed for us with this uh, one meter extensible rail and a little longer reach uh, and so on. And then there's a, you know, actuator. This is, we called this the science door. When this was fully assembled, it would have a sample tray uh, kind of right in here that the arm could, uh, could place stuff into. So the, the concept was that the sub was very hydrodynamic on descent. The door would open at the bottom, door would open at the bottom, and the arm would reach out, take samples, put them inside the door, and it would all fold back up uh, for ascent. And that actually worked pretty well when it worked, as we did have some hydraulic failures. And a couple of times I had to surface with the door open, which tended to wash out some of the samples. Um, OK, I'm not quite sure why this thing doesn't respond. OK, so this is a uh, sphere going on, pod going on. Ah, this is good. There's your battery packs. So this is the, uh, the lower pod going on to the, uh, to the beam, held on by a number of, uh, of fasteners around right here. And uh, ah, okay. So these are the polycarbonate uh, uh, boxes that held the uh, the packs of of 16 cells. Here, are the 16 cocam cells with their uh, drive with, with their individual cell boards. And these battery boxes were interesting because they were actually internally compensated. You can see right at the end. Oh, sorry, I missed it. There's an internal bladder that allows seawater to enter the battery uh, without touching the electronics. And uh, that, was, that proved to be a better system because we didn't want to have to plumb a centralized uh, uh, compensator system to so many different batteries. So here you can see the fully populated uh, three, uh, I'm not sure what that is, starboard modules, uh, sorry, port, port, uh, port modules. So we had six battery buses in all. This is the, the uh, electronics integration in progress. Again, that was all done within that two-month two -month period. So it was a bit, uh, a bit frenzied. Okay, I want to stop on this. This is our uh, Lander 1, and this was built by uh, Kevin Hardy, at, uh, who used to, to run the engineering, uh, deep ocean engineering department at Scripps Institute. And uh, you've got Vitrovec sphere at the top, uh, lifting structure here, the electronics, the, the uh, uh, release system, which was an edge tech system, some, some of our syntactic foam, 
And then uh, this is the payload area down here that contained another uh, syntactic, uh, sorry, uh, Vitrovec sphere that, that uh, held a uh, Canon 5D camera, 26 megapixel sensor. So we got some very good photos with that. Uh, this is the uh, Lander 2, which was uh, primarily used for, t for taking water samples with the four Niskin bottles that you can see there. And um, Doug will, uh, and Kevin will talk more about the, uh, the, the data that was returned by these, uh, these landers, which proved to be very effective uh, science, science platforms. Let's see what we've got next here. Okay, so this is just an animation that shows the sub rotating into its, into its uh, vertical diving position. Here are the camera boom and uh, light boom in action. This is a full HD stereoscopic camera out here on the, on the end of the boom on a pan and tilt, uh, which weighs about four and a half pounds and is full ocean depth rated. So that camera was developed by us. Basically, uh, pretty much all the electronics on the sub uh, that were outboard were developed, uh, developed by us uh, in-house. And you can see the kind of articulation paths of the, of the, you know, the hydraulics here. Uh, now, this fold down was not something I could do on the dive. That's done by the, uh, the dive crew uh, when they're prepping the sub for recovery. And that's the weights coming off and the sub going up. So here's our expedition ship, uh, the Mermaid Sapphire, with the sub in its deck cradle. Uh, we're at Papua New Guinea here. And you can see the various uh, workshops uh, uh, containers in blue there. This is the uh, modular weight system because every dive we had to fine tune the ballast weights to, uh, to fit the depth, the target depth of the dive. We didn't have an active um, hydraulic ballast system on board the sub, so we, uh, we tuned the, uh, the drop weights to the, uh, the final target depth. This is a Red Epic 5K camera that was writing 5K raw files, so we got some very, very good uh, images through the front viewport of the sub that could be blown up uh, significantly, and that's actually proved to be quite valuable in, in uh, discovering some new, uh, some new animals. This is the boom being locked in place pr just prior to launch. Here are the arms of the, uh, uh, the deck cradle coming open in order to launch the sub. Sub going in the water with some big lift bags on it that, that were used to orient the sub initially for the removal of all the uh, lifting, uh, lifting harness and uh, side bridles and so on. Then those, the, the, uh, the middle bags uh, are deflated and, and taken off by the divers and the upper bags are used to hold the sub at the surface in its uh, uh, vertical position prior to diving. And then they're pulled off with a quick release on a lanyard by the, by the divers. And that's how the, uh, the uh, descent was begun. That allowed us to not have <clears throat> a large volume of the sub internally <clears throat> taken up by soft ballast system uh, uh, prior to the dive. So this is just the basic uh, general arrangement of the vehicle. The uh, lower pod, again, you can see the boom arms, the cameras, and the, uh, and the lights, the science door. That's the stereoscopic camera with a matte box to keep uh, stray light. Okay, so there's the, the uh, uh, 400 kg lift bag being detached and the sub beginning its descent. This is a view from my boom camera looking up the side of the vehicle as I'm descending, probably, probably at about three or four knots here. I'm not sure which dive this is from, but you can see that the divers recede uh, away from my field of view quite quickly. And this is a down angle. It's a little dark. I'm sorry. This shot actually shows the sub uh, descending, uh, descending away from, uh, from the camera. This is pretty much what it was like for me inside. I'm switching on the LED lights. You can see the, uh, the viewport here with some particulate drifting through the lights from which I gauged my speed. I also had a, a speed indicator on the inside, but I could ground truth it by watching the particles. This is the, uh, the shot ballast system in action. Here's some, uh, some uh, third-party shots of the sub uh, done at depth from an ROV. Uh, whenever you see the full sub like that, that's, uh, that's a shallower dive. This, this is a deep dive here. I believe this is an 8,000-meter 8, landing taking place here, and that's shot from the boom camera. You can see me controlling the vehicle there with basically two small joysticks. Uh, the vehicle was quite nimble, uh, very, very uh, quick in yaw, very stable, and could make about three knots forward flight. So here I'm rendezvousing with, the, uh, with Lander 1, and you can see its bait arm is deployed. Uh, and here I'm about to take a, um, a sediment core. And the way we did this is that we had the, the uh, uh, core, core samplers built into the uh, science door <clears throat> in such a way that I just had to use the manipulator arm to push them down, and they were spring actuated to return. So we treated it kind of like a punch biopsy. We just land the sub where we wanted the sample. Um, I, the, in the next shot, you'll see that the, uh, the core tube comes down on top of a rock and actually pushes the sub up. But I, I left this in the reel because 
uh, it actually worked very well. It just didn't work in this particular instance, but it allows you to see the, the uh, core tube extending out underneath the sub. So you can see that you get about, I think it was 14 or 16 inches. Yeah, this is pushing the sub up. Um, so we didn't get a sample on that one, but it, but it did work quite well and we were able to return sediment. Now a couple of times the door got stuck open by hydraulics failures and, the, and a lot of it washed out, but we had a one-way valve that, uh, that held some of it in. This is a cusk eel just kind of seeing what's going on with, uh, with the intruder into his realm. These shots were done at uh, 1,200 meters in uh, Ulithi Atoll, primarily for the film, just so that people could see how the sub operated. You can see here the, the sub's yaw rate is uh, quite good. And this was some uh, exploration of some, uh, some cliff structures, uh, some sheer rock faces in uh, Ulithi. Okay, weight's coming off. And this just shows the, uh, the drop weight system in action here. And the ascent rate uh, from Challenger Deep was close to six knots, um, and the sub was quite stable. We used the, that lower stabilizing fin that you might have seen earlier. Uh, you can see the rate of the particulate through the light, <clears throat> through the light beams here is quite, quite high. Um, and so that, but the sub was, uh, was very stable. You can see the Tigon tubing kind of rustling in the currents there. When the sub reached the surface, it was still going about three, three, three and a half knots. And um, so it kind of popped up pretty high. And you can see there's some flotation here. We added this system to the sub uh, late in the program to give, us, give ourselves a little bit of, of extra flotation. It's about an extra 450 kg of, uh, of flotation there and a soft ballast system. That, pressure, that uh, inflated automatically with uh, nitrogen uh, while the sub ascended through the last two or 300 meters of the water column. That was a, uh, a hands-off system. It did it automatically. And uh, after you know, t uh, eight to 11 hours inside the sub, it was good to, to you know, have some fresh air coming out of such a confined space. Here's a good view of the... Um, the 5D camera at the bottom of uh, Lander 1 and the folded up bait arm. And we, we had focus control there and we actually shot uh, images at different focal planes in a kind of cycle. We could shoot about 18,000 stills on a dive because we uh, created an outboard drive to hold a lot of, and that was at full 26 megapixel resolution. So we got a lot of pictures. Of course, a lot of them are wasted, you know, black in the water column, things like that before the lights had come on. And that's the, uh, that's the Lander leaving the surface. Next, we should have a series of images. Uh, these are just sort of, um, uh, this is not meant to, to be a, a little science tour here, but this is just a series of images of the sub uh, in action. This is, uh, these are 5K raw images through the front port. This is a uh, uh, free swimming large holothorian uh, in t at 1,000 meters in the New Britain Trench. And you can see I'm manually controlling the focus there. This is a, uh, another holothorian that, that uh, uh, when he was approached, he, he took off and started to fly like this. I estimate him to be about two-thirds of a meter long. He was quite big. The interesting thing here is this is a fixed camera that's, that's bolted to the sub, and I'm able to maneuver a 12-ton vehicle uh, delicately enough to stay with a soft-bodied animal that's maybe only a meter uh, or less in front of the viewport and stay with him. This is uh, another one of these, uh, these large holothurians, but what's, uh, what's interesting here is this Polychaete worm, uh, 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 maybe somebody out there knows what this thing is. I think it's kind of a, um, Doug, maybe you can tell me what it is. Did you figure out what that, that worm is? I, I can't he's going to come across here, and you'll see that he's got uh, squid-like tentacles. He's going to swim back across the camera here. Here he comes. Yeah, he's a pretty cool animal. <laughs> All right, so this is at 4,000 meters. And these, what, what are these spoonworms? Is that what they are that create those patterns? Oh, yes. Yeah. Those are spoonworms. Right, exactly. Um, so it had these interesting starburst patterns pretty ubiquitously over the bottom. This is the baited trap. So far it hasn't attracted any amphipods, but it will. Uh, it has pulled in some small, small fish. I don't, I don't, do we know, we know what that fish is, obviously. Looks uh, kind of. That's maybe a cusk eel? Yeah, okay. Or, uh, I'm sorry, a. Uh... He looks, oh, now this is an interesting octopus. I was fascinated by. I was fascinated by his method of locomotion with his four front arms just kind of stable over the bottom and his, his back arms pulled under and then kind of cycling. And this is a Bathosaurus uh, fish here. Um, so this is, this is just kind of a, a roundup of uh, New Britain Trench and, and uh, Doug and, and Patty are going to get into the science on that. Uh, this is a, a small jellyfish about uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 8, 10 inches in diameter that... Um, uh, was sort of feeding on the benthos and then would take off when you approach them. There were quite a number of those. This is some of the organic debris that you have at the bottom of the, uh, the New Britain Trench. And then we're going to come up the, uh, the wall here 
in a second. Let me speed this up a bit. I'm kind of running a little long here. Is that moving? Okay. All right, and then these, these are these. Uh, so you can see the steepness of the, uh, of the trench wall there. And these are the large amphipods that Doug's going to tell you a lot about that we baited for in, in the New Britain Trench. And, and uh, there's some new species here, and he'll, he'll explain that in greater detail. So this is, this is Challenger Deep, and by scrutinizing these, uh, uh, these high-definition files, uh, some, some new animals emerge. You can see it's quite flat in the ponded sediment, and um, this was an interesting feature. Um, I'm not sure what this is, but maybe, maybe our science team can, uh, can mention it. Um, but there was, um, most of the animals were quite small, and it took a, a, a real uh, analysis of the video image, so the, the high definition really paid off. This is the terrain on the, uh, on the north slope. Uh, it's, you can see it's a very gentle slope, but it's still enough to create these, these kind of avalanches and so on going down. Uh, but it certainly was not nearly as steep, probably only about a third as steep as the New Britain Trench. So that's that. Um, you know, the interesting thing about this, about this uh, submersible vehicle uh, the Deep Challenger, Deep Sea Challenger, is that, you know, our, of the small team of engineers, only three of them had actually worked on, on uh, uh, manned submersible before. That was myself and Ron Allen, the co-designer, and Tim Bullman, who you saw putting the transducer on. Uh, you know, everybody else was from uh, different backgrounds. Uh, some come from, came from aerospace, from robotics, including marine ro robotics. Um, but the battery system engineer, for example, had done electric buses. Uh, the uh, life support supervisor, John Garvin, was a cave diver who based it on cave diver uh, rebreathers. And um, Walt Conti and Ty Boyce uh, were in charge of building the entire lower pod and showing up with it as a completely functioning, almost kind of mini vehicle uh, itself with all those, you know, uh, manipulator and weight release mechanisms and everything. Um, what they uh, did for their day job is build highly realistic um, hydraulic uh, props for movies like um, the Orca and Free Willy, for example. So, and they'd never, they'd never done anything to go deep before, and all their stuff worked really, really well. You know, I, I really believed in this team, and um, in fact, I, I trusted my life to their engineering. In parallel with the, the sub-development was the lander development, and uh, I sort of talked you through that. But what I didn't mention was that we, we tried to use common components between the landers and the sub. So the, the landers were kind of a spin-off. Within the one project, we were already spinning out the technology that had been developed for the sub. So the landers used the same PBOF lithium batteries, the same uh, LED lights, um, uh, the um, uh, small stereoscopic uh, titanium housed cameras, and, and uh, some of the, the recorder drives and the fiber optic penetrators that we made ourselves. I didn't mention it when I showed the penetrator plate, but we tried to get the best manufacturer of penetrators to make a fiber optic penetrator, and they took three years to do it. And uh, we finally got one. And they told us it would be 18 months to get a second one. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it, we eventually wound up making our own, and Ron Allen did it in, uh, in a week. <laughs> and he doubled the number of fiber, fiber pass-throughs. And I, that's, that's what I trusted my life to when I dove, was the one that Ron Allen took a week to make, not the one that, that the company that shall remain nameless took three years to make. Um, so we started by making some shallow dives of the sub in the Sydney area. And then we took our show on the road to Papua New Guinea to the New Britain Trench. Um, and I, I actually dove in the New Britain Trench at 1,000 meters, 4,000, 7,000, and 8,000 meters, uh, working my way down to the deepest spot. And Doug and Patty are going to present uh, details on, on the science from those dives. Uh, the deepest of the dives was on March 7th to a depth of 8,221 meters. And that made uh, the Deep Sea Challenger the deepest diving piloted vehicle that's currently operating uh, in the world. Obviously some of the, like the Trieste bathyscaphe obviously went, went uh, quite a bit deeper than that, but it's not operating. Um, so despite the usual teething pains, the sub proved to be reliable and, and capable, and the landers were also bringing us gold in terms of samples and images. So we concluded the, the sea trials, we displaced to Guam to stage for the 11,000 meter dives. But at this point we were starting to run out of time because the, the, the ship had to go to uh, another charterer, and uh, in addition, the weather was not cooperating. We were finally able to 
uh, only dive the sub uh, twice, once, once as an unpiloted test and once piloted. Um, the unpiloted dive was done in the West Depression or pond, if you will, of the three ponds that comprise Challenger Deep. And this pond is also called the Vichas Deep, uh, and it's where the bathyscaphe Trieste dove in 1960. And in an, you know, an amazing kind of uh, ellipse in, in history, Don Walsh, who was the commander of the Trieste for that historic dive 52 years ago, was actually on board our ship with us uh, earlier this year. And um, uh, he helped us with the navigation, and we dove the sub on the unpiloted dive at roughly the same spot as his dive. The depth recorded by the Deep Sea Challenger on that dive was uh, 10,872 meters, or 35,669 feet. Uh, however, we're using the uh, Leroy Parthio formula to correct the UNESCO formula for that particular water column, and that yields a corrected depth of 10,885 meters. And this is a bit shallower uh, than uh, by, by about uh, 80 feet uh, from uh, Trieste's published depth of uh, 35,798 feet. So they obviously landed um, a slightly deeper part of that uh, West Depression. Uh, a few days later, on uh, March 26th, I piloted the sub to the, the bottom in the center of the east pond of the Challenger Deep. That was about 55 kilometers to the east. Um, I left the surface at 5.15 a.m., and the descent was two and a half hours. And as planned, the vehicle left the surface 630 kilos negative at a rate of uh, 4.5 knots, or 136 meters per minute. And then it arrived, it con continuously slowed throughout its descent and arrived at the bottom neutrally buoyant. And that's due to the differential compression between the seawater and the sub itself due to the uh, difference in the bulk modulus which uh, induces a considerable amount of buoyancy at depth. The exact coordinates for the dive were um, 11 degrees, 22.1 minutes north, 142 degrees, 35.36 uh, minutes east. And that's right in the center of the east pond. Uh, this was identified by the Jamstech ROV Kaiko in 1998 as the deepest spot in the Challenger Deep, and in fact, Pretty much the first thing I saw when I got to the bottom and started tr transecting horizontally was uh, a track across the bottom made by the skids of the uh, Keiko ROV. So that's how I knew I was in the right spot. The descent, you, mean, you never, you know, when, you, when you're just leaving the surface like a missile heading for the center of the earth, you know, trust in the coordinates is, you got to trust your coordinates. Uh, even if you bought them on the black market, you know. <laughs> The descent was uh, pretty uneventful, uh, with the one difference from my, my prior deep dives that um, I was always very heavily task loaded when I was diving, uh, operating all the subsystems, and I'd go through a, a checklist. And I actually burned through my whole checklist by the time I got to 8,000 meters and still had 3,000 meters left to, to go uh, with pretty much nothing to do but do my uh, uh, comm checks every 15 minutes and sit quietly and think about the pressure building up on the outside of the hull. <laughs> So I arrived at, at the bottom, neutrally buoyant, as planned. I made a nice gentle touchdown and saw that the terrain appeared to be uh, you know, completely flat. I, I called in, reported my depth and, the, and status, and t it turned out that the acoustic comms were functioning perfectly uh, for voice. And we had, expected, we had actually expected that they wouldn't and that I would have to, to uh, uh, default to texting. And I was uh, very grateful that I didn't have to do that because texting while driving is not a good thing, <laughs> as we all know, especially if you're you know, using two hands to operate seven joysticks and you're seven miles down. Uh, so a after I arrived, the first thing I did was take uh, a sediment core because you know, kind of a contingency sample in case something went wrong, at least I was going to come back with something. Uh, and I could take that anywhere in the ponded sediment. And then um, you know, after working with the, uh, with the hydraulics a bit, uh, I, I promptly noticed a, a big swarm of yellow oil globules floating up, and I knew I had a hydraulic leak, and uh, a, a hose a, a coupling had parted, unfortunately, as the, as the arm extended. And so um, I lost all my hydraulic oil, and I couldn't take any samples anymore beyond that point. But I still had my thrusters and my cameras and my lights, so I figured I could go exploring and get, a, get an overview, maybe, maybe see some animals even if I couldn't uh, grab anything. So I began a, a short run actually to the south, 
which, which if I hadn't landed in the center would take me more to the center or, or past it. Um, and I went about uh, 200 meters to see if the depth would increase and it didn't increase at all. So the reading when I landed remained the maximum depth for the dive. And the indicated depth was 35,756 feet or 10,898 meters. And then with the Leroy Parthio correction, the depth was uh, 35,803 feet or 10,913 meters. And this turns out to be exactly five feet deeper than Don Walsh's published depth. But since we all know that the, the error in the, in the depth instruments is much, much greater than that, um, uh, certainly even, even now versus whatever the error might have been in his instruments at the time, um, 52 years ago, we're just going to have to call it a tie. <laughs> and Don, Don was very gracious when I returned to the surface and he offered to share the record with me, but unfortunately I don't think he can legally speak for Jacques Picard. Uh, the interesting thing is that here we have two identical depths from two dives that were actually 55 kilometers apart, which I think is, is significant. So I performed a two kilometer transect to the north and I reached the north slope of the trench and then I ascended a short distance and the slope was very, very mild compared to, um, as you saw, compared to the New Britain Trench. And then finally, I had some water ingress problems and some, some low state of charge readings on some of my batteries. Uh, and I lost the thrusters on, on the starboard side, so I lost steering authority. And after three hours of bottom time, uh, I basically had to call it because I, I had no functionality left. And I hate this, by the way. I hate having to go back. Uh, I was planning on staying down for, for five or six hours. Uh, so I dropped the weights and I ascended and it was the highest ascent rate I'd experienced because it was the deepest depth and therefore the, the greatest amount of ballast offset and, and therefore the highest forcing. So um, uh, the, the rate was around six knots and I reached the surface in 73 minutes from full ocean depth, which is good because that's when your butt's really sore on the return leg. You don't know that you're, you're, so, you're so focused and curious and, and, and just fascinated by everything and then when you're coming back and there's nothing to do, that's when you notice how much it hurts. Uh, so this finished the piloted dives for the expedition, but Lander 1 dove twice more, once in the center pond, which had no data from the bottom, uh, had, uh, nobody had been down there, and also in the, the Sirena Deep. And the Sirena Deep uh, dive, uh, we, we got some amazing results, and Kevin's going to show you that. Um, so just, just sort of rounding up here, you know, the expedition was a success from the science perspective, and I think you'll see that. Um, we and we proved the two vehicle systems uh, to be, to be, you know, despite the teething pains, to to be very adequate. However, I personally feel that we just barely got started before we had to to turn back, and that there's just so much more down there. I, I, you know, when I was looking out the viewport with my own eyes at depth, which I made sure that I that I did just to see what that that felt like, I was struck by how much we don't know, how vast. Uh, is, is, is the unexplored realm down there. And these deep trenches are, are places where life might have emerged on this planet. Uh, they're geologically dynamic uh, places where these cataclysmic forces are released that, that unleash these tsunamis uh, upon us, like in the, what happened in Indonesia and Japan in, in recent years. So these mysteries that need to be unraveled in the Hadal Depths actually affect all of us. Um, hopefully, Deep Sea Challenger and, and our landers will dive again, and if not, at the very least, the, uh, uh, the innovation, the technical innovations can be incorporated into other uh, vehicle platforms and, and uh, you know, benefit the marine research community. So speaking of marine research and, and actual scientists, I want to turn this over to Doug Bartlett so he can show you some of the amazing things that we found down there. And so, Doug, take it away. Thanks. I'd like to take you very quickly through some of the discoveries made by the scientists associated with the Deep Sea Challenge expedition, largely those associated with biological questions. But at the outset, I do want to emphasize a point that Jim just made, and that is that the sub had a CTD. So it was able to measure conductivity, temperature, and depth during all of its dives. And those kinds of fundamental physical measurements are really limiting in, in deep ocean environments. And so here you see the sub being deployed in the Challenger Deep. 
Professor Lynn Talley, a physical oceanographer at, at SIO, has analyzed some of that CCD data. And on the left, what you see are two plots, one in blue of potential temperature, one in red of the, a the absolute temperature. And you see that the temperature is actually increasing at depth in the Challenger Deep. That's a result of pressure. That's adiabatic heating going on there. On the right, you see a salinity profile as a function of depth for the two deployments in the Challenger Deep. And you see that the salinity is increasing from eight kilometers on. And that could very well represent a new current coming into the, the Challenger Deep, a current that is as yet undescribed. So there's a great need for these kinds of measurements in the Challenger Deep and other parts of the Mariana Trench and other trench environments. It tells us about heat flow, carbon, introduction at depth, nutrient exchange at depth. These are really important questions, and we need more of these kinds of analyses being done. OK, what about the biology? Jim showed you some really stunning images from various uh, depths. Let me take you through some of the biology that was observed. And there was a very nice write-up in Science shortly after the conclusion of the expedition by Richard Lutz and Paul Falkowski from Rutgers University, providing a, a sense of some of what was seen. The four sites that we've looked at in the greatest detail, and this comes from Natasha Gallo, who is here, and Lisa Levin from Scripps. The four sites we've concentrated are on are the, the one kilometer site in the New Britain Trench, the 3.8 kilometer site in the New Britain Trench, 8.2 kilometers in the New Britain Trench, and then finally the Challenger Deep. And so what you can see in these four images are rep representative views of what the environment look like. So you know already from what has been described to you that the New Britain Trench was really organically rich. We saw coconut tree fronds and leaves on the seafloor. It also had a lot of sediment mounds that influenced the biodiversity dramatically. These provided hard substrates for crinoids and soft corals and, and uh, anemones and, and crustaceans and fish associated with those sorts of environments. So that really ramped up the biodiversity that was there. The New Britain Trench full of spoonworms. If, you, if you've never thought of loving worms, if you had seen these videos, you would love worms. They were everywhere. They dominated the view everywhere Jim dove. And then at 8.2 kilometers, the first part of the dive was dominated by acorn worms. These are advanced, evolutionarily advanced hemichordates, a fascinating understudied group of, of organisms. And then when he moved up along that hard substrate of the trench wall, he saw hundreds of these beautiful stalk sea anemones, as, as he showed you. And then finally, there's the forlorn and alien-like image of the Challenger Deep, where the biomass was dramatically reduced, very low input of organics far away from, from island uh, input. Natasha has quantified the video data, quantifying the organisms that are there and the biodiversity of life that was present in these four environments that, that Jim surveyed. And so here you're seeing plots of the number of species identified or, or extrapolated to exist as a function of sample size. The top curve represents the one kilometer dive site. That was by far the most diverse. Below that, the environments were much less diverse and black. At the bottom is the Challenger Deep, um, by far the least diverse environment. Natasha has looked at that data in a little bit more detail, dividing the sorts of organisms into different categories. And at, at one kilometer, there were a lot of actively swimming demersal foragers, like the pelagic sea cucumbers that, that Jim was showing you images of, some swimming worms, scale worms, swimmer worms, and, and so on. At 3.8, we've got uh, 3.8 kilometers, we have the uh, the spoon worms, the New Britain Trench was dominated at, at 8.2 kilometers by this beautiful stalk sea anemones. And then the Challenger Deep, you see overall the numbers of organisms, the amount of biomass greatly reduced. Just a few kinds of organisms really to draw your attention to. Three, three kinds of organisms. Two are highlighted in this slide. So we had xenophyophores, a kind of protozoan. You might think of protozoa as things you see in a microscope looking at some pond water, maybe as a high school student. But these can actually grow to, to macroscopic sized organisms. These xenophyophores are, are for types of soft-bodied foraminifera that live off of particulates 
all over the seafloor, especially at the, at the greater depths like the Challenger Deep. You see the plot there of the numbers of these organisms with depth, and they went up dramatically in the Challenger Deep. And also on the bottom, you see you, you've got the, the, the manipulator arm in view there, and just down from it, you see boxed in a tiny little creature. That's a uh, a sea cucumber. It's a kind of sea cucumber that appears based on Natasha's anal analyses of the, the uh, posterior and anterior views uh, to be a, a Mariotrochus species. It's a kind of organism that's been dredged up from Soviet trawls in the, in the Mariana Trench going back to the 50s, but they were much smaller. This is, this is a much larger organism, perhaps an example of gigantism, perhaps a new species, certainly something that is worthy of additional study. And that's true for the Holothurians in general. This is, incidentally, this is a close-up view of one of these protozoa, these xenophyophores. They have an interesting but very delicate structure, very difficult to collect, so you wouldn't pick them up in a trawl sample. The video capabilities of the sub were ideal for, for looking for them. These Holothurians, though, dominated the view. They were the dominant megafauna of the deep sea at, at, at uh, all of the locations. There on the, on the bottom right, you see at 8.2 kilometers, a little sea pig. They were all over the place at 8.2 kilometers depth. So the, the Holothurians, the sea cucumbers, were, were in, in all of the dives. In terms of the amount of Holothurians, they were very dominant at the greater depths at 8.2 kilometers depth in the New Britain Trench and at 10.9 kilometers in the Challenger Deep. In terms of diversity, though, it was the shallower environments, again, that, that had the greatest diversity, one kilometer in the case of the Holothurians. Okay, the lander, as Jim mentioned, was very good for recovering uh, scavengers, in particular amphipods. So here you see the view above and here below water. The, the landers were fantastic at collecting amphipods. These are gigantic amphipods, the deepest example of this phenomenon of gigantism yet seen. Very large. These are organisms that are usually the size of the last digit of your thumb. And in this case, they were as long as 17 centimeters in the trap, and there were a number that were too big to get in the trap that were 30 centimeters or so in size. So enormous organisms. We've gone on since recovering them, getting them back to, to Scripps to do some phylogenetic analyses of the organisms. This has been done by Carvajal and, and Rouse. And we see that from both the Challenger Deep and from the New Britain Trench, there are multiple species of these amphipods. The big guys, the big monsters from the 8.2 kilometer collection site turn out to be very closely related to small little um, one, two centimeter long amphipods recovered from the Kermadec Trench. So there seems to be a, a lot of, of species divergence within amphipods in these deep trenches, and there's also the possibility of these amphipods moving, dispersing from one trench, such as the Kermadec in the Southern Ocean, uh, to, uh, to the New Britain Trench and perhaps beyond fr from there. I think this is a fascinating result. This comes from some biochemical analyses of the recovered amphipods, and it's from Paul Yancey, who's at Whitman College in Washington. He's been looking at the organic osmolites in these collected amphipods. Shallow water crustaceans like shrimp for osmolites have a lot of amino acids like glycine. The deep ocean amphipods, however, had lots of trimethylamine and oxide. That's a compound that appears to help tissues and proteins, membranes function better at high pressure. And I think even more amazingly, Paul discovered skyloinositol. Skyloinositol is currently in clinical trials because it breaks down the amyloid plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So an incredible discovery. Who would have thought that a drug being used in clinical tri trials for Alzheimer's would be found in a deep ocean amphipod? We also use the amphipods to culture microbes. They're a great source for microbes on their exoskeleton, inside their guts. We cultured at high pressure in pressure vessels, as you see here, low temperatures, variety of physiological conditions. And these are incubators here at a, at a low temperature at pressures up to 16,000 or more PSI. 
This plot here shows the distribution of microbes that have been recovered over the years that grow at high pressure. Some over towards the left of this plot are, are, are species that have been recovered from cold, deep ocean samples. On the right, from hydrothermal vent and warmer temperature types of environments. The sorts of organisms that we were able to, to grow grew at the highest pressures of any organisms yet described from 80 to 100 megapascal, depending on the Britain Trench versus the, the Challenger Deep. And we also have some that are coming up at a fairly warm temperature, which is useful for some of the biophysical studies that my colleagues would like to conduct. We were successful in part because we use trimethylamine and oxide, the osmolite found in these crustaceans as a substrate for the microbes to breathe. And we use a lot of different carbon and energy substrates. These microbes will grow off of detergents, methanol, uh, complex polysaccharides, and, and so on. We've also looked to study those microbes that we can't yet culture by using culture-independent methods. We've sorted using a fluorescently activated cell sorter 20,000 microbes collected from various parts of the Challenger Deep, and we have amplified their genomes, and we've begun to do some phylogenetic characterization on what we have, and eventually we'll sequence their genomes. Th these are some rare fraction analyses of some of the samples that we've looked at from amphipods, and the seawater associated with amphipods brought back, we have found large numbers, in some cases essentially pure cultures, of this organism, Saccharomonas, a microbe well known for producing polyunsaturated fatty acids that we're supposed to get in our diet because they're so heart healthy. From the mud that Jim was able to collect in the Challenger Deep, we've characterized the microbes there. It's incredibly diverse. Lots of microbes whose closest relatives are only found in other deep ocean samples. But we did find, oddly enough, lots of cyanobacteria coming apparently to the deep ocean as phytodetritus. So those studies continue as well. Okay, I just want to wrap this up. So in terms of some of the take-home messages for you, we're getting deep CTD measurement, and that's providing information on heat and, and, and nutrient exchange at great depth. We've discovered holothurians in the Challenger Deep. We've discovered the deepest example of gigantism yet described. Multiple species of amphipods exist in these environments. Novel osmolites are present, and there are many extremophilic microbes that we have either in culture or that we've sorted and have, uh, have genomic material to characterize. So with that, I want to move on to the next science presentation. That will be by Dr. Patty Fryer from the University of Hawaii. I've told you about the life in these subduction zones, but more fundamental still is the subduction process itself and what that means to life and what that means to, to hazards. And Patty will share that with you. Well, thanks very much. Um, what I wanted to start out with, and I'll try to be quick with this because we want to leave some time for questions, um, but, but what's really important about studying deep sea trenches for the scientific community assembled here, but also for the general public, obviously they're deep. They give us uh, the deepest look at the lithosphere of the Earth. They are the places where some of the most devastating hazards take place, natural hazards on the Earth's surface earthquakes and tsunamis generated by them. And what we're hoping to do uh, with the ma material presented here is also to, to tell you a little bit about perhaps some of the important chemical reactions and what the uh, Im implications are for those, and also how those interactions may tie into biological processes, and therefore potentially for issues related to the origin of life. And uh, definitely want to change the minds of uh, these characters here. Whoop, go back one, please. Can you read that? I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. This is my favorite cartoon from The New Yorker by Charles Saxon. So we're going to try to change her mind. OK, so obviously the, the tragic events that took place last year in Japan with the Tohoku earthquake uh, devastated physical um, materials, people's lives, and of course lost tens of thousands of, of individuals in that tragedy. Um, I was offered um, 
a model that I'll show you here for about a minute that was generated by folks at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, uh, mainly uh, Dylan Wang with, with the model and Nathan Becker with the animation. So let's take a look at this. This shows the beginning of the tsunami wave traveling across the Pacific. And you can see as it does so when it interacts with the continental margins, there's reflection of that energy back into the Pacific Basin. And you'll notice as, as this animation goes forward that that, that tremendous amount of energy um, is uh, traveling back and forth across the Pacific, it doesn't reach the South American coastline until about 22, 23 hours. And you'll see the big reflection that goes back toward the source from South America and keeps that entire ocean in motion for days. Also notice that some of that energy is migrating into the, the Atlantic and into the Indian Ocean. In fact, most of this energy kept going for at least uh, two days and longer with diminishing effects. But uh, one of the most important things that you'll see at the very end of this is that the tsunami uh, wave amplitude pattern that was generated by this earthquake was modeled on the basis of the, the nature of the seismic activity that took place in the uh, Japan Trench, but also an intimate knowledge of the bathymetry of the Pacific Basin. So understanding the structure and the morphology of these basins and the trenches around them are very important. Most of the big earthquakes that take place in the trenches don't happen very often, but uh, they do all happen in the trench regions. And you can see by this map where the open circles are, are places where the seismological community is predicting that perhaps there will be more of these very large events. So getting a better hand on what's going on in trenches, such as by going down there with submersibles, taking a close look at the structures and the processes is very important. So I'm going to take you first to Jim's dive in uh, the New Britain Trench. And as he mentioned, he was given access to a German bathymetric profile. It just happened to go across the, you know, a great spot. This was by the uh, research vessel Sona. And the dive spot is in uh, where the upper arrow is indicating. And again, it just so happens that the bathymetry in that area is very interesting. Apparently, there was a big slump from the inner trench wall, that dark pink area is the larger debris mass, but the lighter pink shows where the fines were distributed eastward toward a couple of fault scarps in green on the right-hand side of your, of your image. Jim's dive was toward the south going from, um, probably went a little bit further up north, it's landed in the middle of the trench and traversed the southern uh, slope up, up a fault scarp there. And, um, I'm going to show you just a quick cross-section of what that looked like. The, the trench floor was pretty flat, as he mentioned, a lot of bioturbation. And as he went up the next two terraces, there was less and less bioturbation, suggesting that those areas were more recently resurfaced, it, so the critters didn't have access to them until fairly recently. But he ended the dive in a series of pillow lavas that um, actually I don't think there have ever been any deeper pillow lavas observed on the seafloor on the incoming plate at a subduction zone. Pillow lavas, as you know, form uh, these bulbous shapes as lava comes out and quenches in the cold surrounding seawater and either forms pillow-shaped things or tubes like at the top of the picture. Well, this is what Jim saw in an outcrop that was probably um, a fault scarp so that you see where the, the white uh, curves are. I've outlined the tops of some of these pillows and uh, this, is a, this is an in-situ outcrop. This is a great place for somebody to go out and do some dredging or some additional diving and find out what that northern part of the subducting plate is composed of in terms of composition. Next slide is a comparison between, on the same scale, now this is from Google Maps, um, you'll see how large the uh, island of New Britain and, and New Ireland are compared to the a very tiny little Guam underneath that red balloon. And the Challenger Deep isn't anywhere near land surfaces. So there's much less uh, of nutrients delivered into that part of the trench. The reason it's so deep 
as many of you know, is that uh, the oldest seafloor on the planet is being subducted there. The Jurassic Age Pacific Plate's about 180 million years close to the trench axis. Challenger Deep's a little bit over um, toward Palau. So I'm going to show you a perspective view of that region now. The, the box on the uh, left-hand side shows you where this is. You're looking kind of northeast along this uh, perspective view. The Challenger Deep is marked by uh, a cross down kind of in the, the lower center of the, uh, of the image. And then the Serena Deep is right under where it says Mariana Trough. And that spot is right where a big left lateral strike slip fault uh, just to the west of Guam intersects the trench and it's very likely that that's the reason the Serena Deep is the second deepest place uh, in the trenches of the world. So if we look in detail at the Challenger Deep, the upper picture is the bathymetry and the two stars, red stars, mark where the Trieste landed and where Deep Sea Challenger landed on Jim's dive. The landers, actually, there was a lander placed over uh, by where the Trieste dove and one right in the center pond. So this expedition of, of Jim's actually covered all three of the ponds. The lower image is a side scan backscatter um, image that shows the the roughness of the seafloor. The dark areas are rougher areas or scarps, and the sinuous, very faint lines that you see below the white line, which is the trench axis on the lower image, show where there are huge fault scarps on the incoming plate. As it bends, normal faulting takes place, and the, the smaller dark patches you see are where debris has fallen off those slopes and migrated down toward the trench. These are uh, the, this is actually a bathymetry map of that eastern pond. And uh, at 20 meter contours, the, the deepest area that we traversed with the nearest uh, HROV, which is a hybrid remotely operate, operated vehicle that the Woods Hole folks put together, uh, went across some of that, what we thought was, was going to be topography, went up onto the incoming plate, went back across, and then up north. That's the red arrows. And uh, basically everything we saw was pretty flat at um, 10,900 and about 24, 25 meters. The red cross you see is where the Keiko uh, ROV from Jamstech found their deepest point. And then we put Jim down in the eastern part of the East Pond at about the deepest place we could find. Tell him, we told him to go southwest toward that deepest contour, which on this map is at about nine, uh, 10,970 meters flat floor. So, so those features did not show up. And what that means probably is that there is a sediment cover over that entire area, very, very fine sediment, very porous, very wet, and we are seeing through it with the sonar imagery to a depth of about 60 meters. So what's so special about the Marianas? Why should we study this trench? Well, it's unusual in that it doesn't have an, a, a huge accretionary prism of sediment drape, uh, scraped off the downcoming plate. So the rocks are exposed right in, in the trench axis. And the fluids that are being distilled off the downgoing plate are rising through the overlying mantle, serpentinizing it, altering it. And through the faults in the overriding plate, that material is coming up to the surface, burping out and forming immense serpentine mud volcanoes that give us a, a direct look at the most pristine fluids coming off the downgoing plate. So we can track the chemistry of the reactions going down the subduction zone. And this is just a sketch across section showing the general processes of that. As the plate descends, is exposed to greater temperatures and pressures, different reactions take place, resulting in different trace elements in the fluid chemistry of the seep fluids coming out at the tops of the seamounts or in other seeps on the seafloor. So that green hatched area that you see at, at, uh, below the seafloor is where we think serpentinization is going on related to the release of these fluids, uh, serpentinizing the olivine and pyroxene that makes up the peridotide of the mantle. So if we take a look at the next slide, okay. Um, up at the surface of, of these seeps, we find these beautiful intricate uh, carbonate chimneys. You may have also heard of these discovered in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge at the Lost City. Again, related to serpentinization of peridotite mantle material. So 
if carbonate is forming on the seafloor and we have carbonate problems in the atmosphere, uh, there may be ways to sequester carbonate in relation to the kinds of reactions going on in subduction zones. People have talked about it for a long time in a whole variety of different uh, ways of doing it, underground in various um, reservoirs, pumping it into the ocean, which is going to be a problem because of the increased acidification and damage to coral reefs, which are the base of food chain for so many forms of life, including our own. So then the question remains, you know, will we survive? So some remedies are easier than others. And uh, if we take clues from nature herself, which is obviously doing it in, uh, in the Mariana region, um, the idea of sequestering carbon dioxide in peritatitic bodies has been around for about 20 years. But recently, some of our geochemical colleagues and petrologists have looked to try to quantify this. And Peter Kellerman and his group published a paper in 2009 in which they suggested that a billion tons of injected CO2 per cubic kilometer of peritatite or serpentinite material rock per year could be accomplished if you heat the water up a little bit and, and suffuse it with a lot of carbon dioxide. So potentially that's great. So as I said, nature herself is doing it. And the reactions that take place also potentially have significance for the origin of life. The, uh, the serpentinization reactions basically are turning mantle rock composed of olivine and uh, pyroxene Forced to write goes to serpentine, that's an olivine mineral, combined uh, with water gives you um, serpentine and brucite. Um, pyroxenes give you serpentine, a little bit of talc. If you combine forced to write and enstatite, the two main mantle minerals, you get serpentine. But most of the forced to write, uh, or rather the olivine, is uh, um, magnesium, but there's about 10% that contains an iron component. And that reaction with water gives you magnetite, a little silica in solution, and hydrogen. The reason I colored it pink is like it's cotton candy to microbes, and very important for their metabolic processes. So you've heard a little bit about the microbes from Doug. Uh, we also found uh, macroorganisms at some of the seeps. This is one on the top of one of the serpentine seamounts at 3,000 meters. Archaea are the dominant basic subs uh, subsurface microbial population here. Recently, some of my colleagues from Japan discovered even deeper seeps just north of the Challenger Deep region at about 5,000 and 61 meters. And these, again, are hosted in uh, serpentinized peridotite environments and very likely at seep sites. So one of the questions that we're really interested in is whether archaea have the potential to ride the plate down to, to, uh, to even significant depths at, at temperatures that Doug is telling me might um, top out at about 150 degrees C. So if that were true, then there is a potential for this kind of environment to be the one where life could have evolved on our own planet. So uh, the biological community has come up with some very interesting ideas recently in that this textbook view, since we discovered hydrothermal life at uh, mid-ocean ridges in the 70s, it's been, you know, that's the place for chemosynthetic life. Well, biologists now are beginning to consider well, maybe we need a cooler environment, and that's because some of them are saying that the progenitor molecules aren't stable long enough at the high temperatures at a mid-ocean ridge to then uh, progress to the evolution of cells. And how early might there have been liquid water on Earth to help with the serpentinization reactions that give us the hydrogen? Well, zircon crystals from Western Australia give an age of uh, 4.2 billion years, and their isotopic compositions say, yeah, might have been cool enough for liquid water on the surface of the Earth. And if that's true, then um, what's interesting most recently at, is that Pons and her, her colleagues found that in the Greenian, Greenland Ishwa Formation, one of the oldest greenstone belts on the planet, the, um, if you look at the, the column on the left-hand side, the, the orange zircon isotopic values are very similar to those in the Marianas and quite dissimilar from any other rock types that they compared them to. And uh, she's suggesting that the, the fluids that are, are suffusing through the serpentinites viewed in the Ishua formation 
look very much like those that suffuse the serpentinite mud volcanoes of the Marianas, and in fact, she thinks the structures may be identical. So these may be 3.8 billion year old mud volcanoes in a, uh, in a subduction zone. So if that's true, and there might have been Hadean life on our planet, not at mid-ocean ridges, but perhaps in serpentinizing environments, then that might have been a possibility for the evolution of life on our planet, or perhaps other planets in our solar system, or elsewhere like, say, oh, I don't know, Pandora? <laughs> so maybe we should get Kevin to tell us more about uh, the evolution of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move quite quickly through my presentation so we have time for questions afterwards. Um, that said, I'm giving a science presentation at 2.40. I forget what room it is. Um, but uh, if you want to see more about the, um, the data that I'm going to present here, I'll be spending more time on it later. So much of my work is focused on the Sirena Deep lander uh, images and samples. Uh, Doug and Jim went through the lander a bit, so I won't uh, discuss the anatomy of the lander. Uh, but soon after the lander touched down in the Sirena Deep, it started taking these pictures. And what you're looking at here is a sequence of images as the lander was reorienting, I think, due to sort of weather veining with the ocean currents. And that allowed us to get these stills across the landscape. Uh, and at the end here, you'll see the deployment of the, uh, of the Niskin bottle arm onto the sediments that occurred about six hours into the dive. The full panorama is shown here. This is the landing site. And I'll zoom in on a few very intriguing spots here. But on a broad scale, what I'd like you to notice is that on the right, we've got what we think are some talus blocks. Uh, and then on the left, we've got some actual outcrop, and we'll zoom in to, uh, to see what's going on there. Now, Patty has placed the lander towards the southwestern end of the Sirena Deep, and that's shown in the bathym bathymetry map up to the right. Uh, and uh, just for those of you thinking about this lander coming down, terminal velocity for this lander was maybe a few meters per second. Uh, and being a planetary scientist, I couldn't help but wonder if there was some sort of impact crater. Uh, but there's not much of a disturbance there. However, I do think that those, those talus blocks were perhaps cleaned a little bit by the percussive force of, uh, of the impact. So zooming in, this is what we see. It's an astonishing, astonishingly bizarre, uh, what we think is microbial ecosystem populating these talus blocks. Uh, these filaments are in the range of just a few inches in length, but they cover these blocks uh, quite abundantly. And to see this kind of structure, even though we knew there must have been microbes down there, and obviously Doug had characterized the water column, to see this kind of uh, mat in organized form was, was a real, um, uh, quite a surprise. And of course then leads to the question of, well, what's, what's powering these microbes? What's serving as the base of the food chain here? And that's where if we take a, a scan a little bit further to the left and look at some of those outcrops, I think we might get some clues about uh, what's driving this ecosystem. And just by visual inspection, you can see that these outcrops are presenting some alteration products of what is likely the, the base peridotite rock there. And zooming in even further, we see what we think are aragonite uh, veins, possible lizardite and brucite within that matrix of the alter altered outcrop. So we think that this outcrop has undergone serpentinization. And that serpentinization, as Patty mentioned, with the, uh, the, the hydrogen and the methane that could be uh, diffusing upwards out of it, could then help power these uh, microbial mats that we've identified. Now, unfortunately, in terms of sample collection, there was no arm on the lander or, and, and despite my best efforts to get a core, on, a, a core tube on the end of this arm to return a, a, a coherent core, uh, none of that worked. However, what did work was to filter out and sieve the Niskin bottle water 
because as you can see from the deployment of the arm, it disturbed the sediments very significantly, and then the currents were such that some of the sediments were uh, driven into the, uh, the Niskin bottle. So after filtering out that water and sieving it all down, we were left with a very tiny amount of sample. Uh, this is a few grams. Uh, each of those little dots is a few millimeters in diameter. Uh, being a planetary scientist and astrobiologist is uh, sort of akin to Mars sample return for me, uh, but uh, of course from the ocean deep. And though this isn't much sample, it's plenty to do some great geochemical analyses. And again, I won't go into great depth here, but the take-home point is that the analysis of the sediments is very consistent with seeing those alteration products uh, of peridotite via serpentinization. So we're seeing the, the silicates, the magnesium hydroxides, uh, and organics consistent with the microbial mats. That, coupled with uh, X-ray fluorescence uh, and ICP, has also corroborated the, the fact that what we're seeing is in part uh, this, uh, these alteration products. Zooming in a little bit further, uh, it was intriguing to see that uh, this, these sediments may also be comprised of sort of a, a, a graveyard for diatoms and, and uh, radiolara, uh, shown here in the, the intricate uh, sort of web-like structure that you see under SEM. So coupling the geochemistry with these filaments that we, we see, uh, I was able to give Doug some, some of the sediments, and, and he did cell sorting and then did the 16S on them. And this is still a work in progress, but uh, as he can provide some more detail on, to first order, what we see is a lot of perichoccus, uh, and then coupled with everything down to Shuanella, which you find just about everywhere. And so this mat may well be dominated by perichoccus. Why it forms those filament structures, we don't quite yet know. But the idea here is that the serpentinization products are feeding up the sulfide, methane, and hydrogen that then through the microbial community uh, is being processed, metabolized, and then fed to each subsequent community upwards. Now having a community like this that is fed by serpentinization and seeing that uh, serpentinization may be occurring along vast swaths of our ocean floor uh, and not just in localized sites like Lost City, where, where you see these very dramatic chimneys. Seeing serpentinization as sort of a, a global feature that is occurring both at hadal depths uh, and at shallower depths is very exciting from a planetary and astrobiological perspective because, as Patty mentioned, we do think that this chemistry could be sort of the, the roots for metabolism. It could be the kind of driving engine that leads to the emergence of life. And, and Mike Russell, my colleague at JPL, and his colleagues uh, have done some great work setting up sort of simulation chambers for alkaline hydrothermal vents interacting with uh, carbonic acid-rich oceans, which we think may have, have uh, been in existence early on Earth. Uh, and so when I think about what we're finding at these ocean depths here on Earth, I can't help but uh, extend that curiosity to oceans beyond Earth, uh, such as the 100 kilometer deep ocean that we think exists today beneath Europa's ice shell, which is maybe a few to as much as 10 kilometers in thickness. And to close, I'll just uh, show you a lander of a different type. Um, this is uh, a conception of Jim's, uh, an animation that he put together many years ago of the type of exploration that I hope we here at AGU will be talking about decades from now. Uh, it's exploration that will allow us to explore this alien ocean to see whether or not uh, the liquid water environment on a world like Europa does in fact harbor life, whether or not it has given birth to a second origin of life, a second sample that we can go and examine and discover whether or not this DNA, RNA, protein paradigm is, is unique to Earth or whether there's a different biochemistry, a different way of getting the business of life done. Now in Jim's conception here, the, uh, the little underwater vehicle goes down to these hydrothermal vents uh, and uh, it doesn't just discover microbes, but it discovers these uh, charismatic macrofauna, which uh, is certainly in my dream of dreams, but uh, 
it'll be a few decades be, before we get to do that. So thank you very much, and I think we'll take questions now. Yes, so well, science is about exploration, innovation, and discovery. Thank you so much for such a vivid demonstration of what those words mean. We do have time for questions. And I know that some of you need to leave for uh, some of the sessions, so please feel free to go. But for those who would like to stay, we will take questions. Uh, I'm going to exercise presidential prerogative and ask the first one. Uh, the Guinness Book of Records has no records with error bars. If, if you get in, will you ask to keep the error bars? I have to ask this as a scientist. Yes, exactly. yes. <laughs> yes thank you. Okay. <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, other questions? We'll take one here. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jim, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the preparation you had to do in order to make the deepest dive and uh, what kind of safety measures there are in place. Well, we were very safety conscious the whole time. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, you have to have a culture of safety on these, on these uh, at-sea operations. Uh, you, you might have gotten a glimpse of that, uh, of that uh, red flotation bag part of our soft ballast system. We had a number of, of uh, you know, redundant systems to get the, the sub back to the surface. Uh, I had ways of jettisoning uh, the various weight systems. I could dump the entire science store that contained 150 uh, uh, kg of shot. Um, and uh, uh, there was also fail-safe releases of the, uh, of the ascent weights. We did extensive testing of the ascent weight system uh, in, in water. Uh, and at uh, temperature and pressure, we even took the entire ascent weight system to uh, uh, Penn State, stuck it in a chamber there, and Walt uh, Conti ran a series of tests on it there to make sure that there would be no mechanical interference of the release mechanism and so on. Uh, basically, if I, if I passed out because of a contaminated atmosphere, the sub would still return uh, essentially on its, on its own. So we had high confidence that the actual sort of elevator platform would work. And then the other question really was life support. Once you're, uh, once you're in, bolted inside that sphere, it's a very, very small uh, volume of air, uh, easily contaminated by even a small electrical fire. So we had a fully redundant life support system, two completely parallel rebreather systems, either one of which could be configured on the fly to, to do the job of the other. One was already plumbed to a, to a, uh, a mask for, as a lung-powered system. The other one was, was open, uh, running on a scrubber fan. Is that the kind of thing that, that you're interested in? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the uh, and we did extensive testing before the dive. Uh, we created a uh, a simulator, which was a steel sphere, thin walled, that had all that was populated with all of the components that would ultimately go in the sub. And uh, over a period of several months, we put it in a uh, a cold room that could essentially freeze it, you know, down to you know, like one or two C, something like that. We did simulated dives. I didn't do them all. My head of life support actually did uh, a dive up to 18 hours. Simulated dive with full cold soak, uh, with layering up uh, electrically warm clothing. You went through all the various backups of a, of a sub-down sort of trapped scenario where the sub fully cold soaked with the electronics off and that sort of thing. I did my pilot training in that sphere. We'd do fire drills, um, you know, using the fire suppression system and then going out to self-lung-powered uh, mask and so on. So we were pretty thorough in our, in our run-up to the dives. In terms of physical preparation, um, you know, I mean, I, I did yoga for six months so I could <laughs> contort myself into the sphere. It wasn't bad once you were in, but getting into it in the deck position where the sub was horizontal, you had to kind of scrunch down underneath all the, all the HD screens and make yourself about this tall to get into the sub. So that was, uh, that turned out, my, my uh, uh, life support supervisor, when he realized that problem, came to me and said, there's a problem. We can't get in the sphere. We were already, we were already on the ship at that point. And <laughs> I said, I'm getting in the sphere one way or another. So we, we figured it out. Okay, we'll Thank take you. one over here. I'm just wondering if there will be a Lego mini kit, a kit with a mini fig of you uh, as an aquanaut. I'd buy it. I like, the, I like the way you're thinking, you know. <laughs> As, as we all know, there's never enough money to do this sort of thing, so if we can do some, some little action figures or something, you know, to help fund the next expedition, I'm all for that. You'd have a room full of buyers, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks. And one over here. Uh, Jim, the uh, technology behind what you've done is, puts me at a loss for words. 
Um, but if we're going to get Thanks. to Europa, uh, this is a question on behalf of that next generation. Um, what are you doing about the uh, outreach? You know, NASA does extensive amounts, and science, technology, engineering, and math has become such a serious problem. We used to be number one or two in the world after Sputnik. We're now number 34 out of the uh, OECD countries. So to get guys like you for this generation that's going to go to Europa, how are we going to do that? It's a, it's a, you know, it's a daunting problem, and uh, you know the the film that that Kevin showed the little clip of with the with the melt probe on Europa, was really uh, very consciously designed to kind of address that problem. It's called Aliens of the Deep. It didn't get widely seen, unfortunately, but uh, the the concept there was to take young charismatic scientists, charismatic macrofauna scientists like uh, like Kevin, and make science aspirational, make it cool. You know, show show that that science is is a uh, is is exploration both intellectual and sometimes physical, uh, and scientists such as Kevin, who's, who's unafraid to project himself into these, these environments. You know, I wanted to make that the subject of film, and in the future, I think there's the opportunity for more films. That, that It's not about breaking science down and, and actually making the film necessarily a teachable moment, as much as inspiring the next generation to want to, to carry the baton and carry the fire. Uh, you know, of, of the kind of work that Kevin's doing right now. And Kevin, maybe if you want to talk about, about uh, plans for Europa and trying to pull together an actual mission. Yeah, the, um, certainly for the, the clip that I showed, there's a lot of technology development that needs to be done there. The frustrating part is that the next step, doing a, a flyby, an orbiter, or even a, a simple lander that wouldn't penetrate the surface, there's actually not that much development that needs to be done. We've got the tools and technology. We just don't have the will right now, and that's frustrating. Um, this kind of exploration needs to be done. It's one of the the the, the most primordial questions. Uh, you know, is there life out there? Are we alone? And we're sitting here just on the precipice of being able to explore these distant worlds uh, for uh, you know just fractions uh, of of a very low cost relative to the, uh, the complexity of them. And we're not doing it. So I hope that uh, within the next decade or so, uh, we will um, utilize the tools and technology that we've developed and have the, um, the, the political desire and will to accomplish these missions. What we're doing at Mars is fantastic. Curiosity uh, is astonishing. Uh, and the next stop uh, should be Europa. Thank you. We'll take one over here. Hello, um, Brian Mitson. I'm the program manager at NSF for the uh, Alvin Upgrade Project. Um, first, I wanted to thank you all for a uh, fascinating discussion of the deep submergence um, science and technology. And even more than that, thank you for sparking a renewed interest in deep submergence research um, in the scientific community <coughs> as well as in the uh, general public. This has actually made my job a lot easier, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, that said, um, the most common question I've been getting since your activity is so, how long did it take Cameron and what did it cost? Um, I have plausible deniability at this point, so you can address that if you want to. But what I really want to ask is if you could discuss a little bit your specific plans for um, transferring the technology or incorporating it into the national facility or other um, research vehicles. Um, now that you made all this, this good progress? Well, I'm not going to say exactly how much it costs because I don't have to. <laughs> um, but it, it was a, I think it was a, 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 a fraction of what it might have cost as a government program because of the way it was done, which was with a small private team, uh, and uh, we didn't have to jump through any bureaucratic hoops. And, and you know, be, I, I pointed out that, that a lot of the team members hadn't even done piloted vehicles before, so in a sense they weren't burdened by this is how it's done. You know, they were able to think outside the box, and I encourage that. And I think some of the radical concepts came out of that, came out of that thinking. Um, and that's, and I think that's that's necessary for n for new vehicle development, not for the type of program that you're doing with the with the Alvin upgrade. Obviously, that's a different kettle of fish because you've got an existing capability and vehicle and existing set of requirements. Um, you know, in, I, I think that um, the goal for me has always been to transfer this technology into the research community, not to sort of hoard it, 
um, or um, uh, you know, or, or treated as uh, as proprietary, that sort of thing. Um, I don't make my money off of off of selling selling uh, uh, deep ocean you know research technology. I make it off of movies. I go re replenish the treasury every few years, making a Hollywood movie, and then come back and, <laughs> and do this work. So you know, my goal is to further research. It's, it sort of ties to the, to the other question about how do we you know how do we create a, a, a passion for science and for, for science and technology. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to be looking to, to transfer this capability, um, not at a component level, but at, but at, the, at the level of the, everything that we developed, um, to whatever entity or entities wants to take it on. And uh, that's, that was my goal from the beginning. You know, like I said at the end of my remarks, I'd love for the sub to dive again. That may not be uh, practical, given you know, scientists have X amount of X amount of money in their their grant funding, and they may not be able to support uh, piloted operations. But certainly, the technology that was developed uh, can be can be repurposed to other platforms. And and as far as I'm concerned, it's open. It's an open source situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jim, um, what have you learned about the steel enclosure? Uh, any surprises in terms of the stresses on the enclosure? And did you have any strain gauges, any ways of, of looking at how it handled the stress? And another question is regarding the FTIR spectrum with, uh, that was shown. I noticed there were hydrocarbon CH stretches in there. Can you care to comment, the other gentleman, on which hydrocarbons specifically? Okay, so I'll do this here. Um, you know, we, we did uh, extensive finite element uh, analysis uh, at the, uh, you know, as we were making the sphere. Um, and one of the advantages of working in the steel is that, that particular steel that we chose is it could be machined after the, the forged hemispheres were, were uh, uh, welded together, uh, the heat and, uh, and after it was heat treated. So we did, we, we, what we did was we did, an, we did a kind of an as-built FEA by doing a laser scan of the sphere and we found some high spots and some slight outer roundness. We were actually able to take it down and we did continued FEA as we took the sphere down. We were able to, to save weight and true it up for true, you know, true uh, concentricity. Around the, around the whole thing. When we were designing it earlier, before we actually started fabrication, we were finding some, some uh, hot spots, uh, some stress risers around the penetrators and uh, around the hatch. Um, and we ultimately decided to use a different material for the hatch, which was, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, 300M. Uh, it's a little bit, little bit stronger, but we couldn't source the 300M in a, in a, in a billet big enough to machine the sphere out of, so we, we actually went with, with separate materials there. And that worked quite well. And then when we were, te we didn't strain gauge it while we were diving, but we did put 28 strain gauge, strain gauges on it at, at kind of known hot spots across the equatorial weld and, and at, at the uh, hatch and penetrator openings and so on. Um, and, and all the curves that were coming out of the pressure test were exactly to our expectations. So we, we felt pretty good about the sphere from the moment of that, that pressure test. Um, Kevin, you want to deal with the hydrocarbon? Sure, yeah, you've got a good eye. I didn't show that for long. Um, the, uh, what you saw, the, the strongest features are the CH features at about 3.44 microns. Uh, and so those are not particularly diagnostic of, of any uh, specific biomolecule. But if you zoom in around the 6 micron region, I was able to see a lot of the, um, the amide features that are associated uh, with beta pleated sh uh, sheets and, and other proteins. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, what, what you saw in that brief spectrum was just the CH, but there's a lot more in there. 